let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. If you want to turn there in your Bibles with us or in your smartphones, iPads, whatever other technology you have, I want to remind us that we do gather together today as those who are found in Jesus Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit, that we all sit under the working of the Word of God among us and that He is working us, in us, to be formed to the image of Christ, which is the image of love. And so today we read from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the field and were keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior is born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope to encourage us from this, this evening, Christ for you, Christ for you. I don't know about you, but there's something about Christmas that is both enchanting and at the same time confusing. You see, because it's really unbelievable news. It's mysterious news that God himself would dwell among us, that God would come to us. And at the same time of this mysterious news, I have in the back of my mind this image. It's an image of little children gathered around a stable, you know, chubby shepherds, and I'm not just talking about my child, uh, chubby shepherds who are gathering around kind of, and it's almost like a mythology at this point. It's like Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving has its own mythology of, you know, little kids going about the first Thanksgiving day. And, of course, you know, that's not really the way that it happened, but we kind of celebrate it in that way anyway. And Christmas can become like that. Christmas can become something that's kind of disenchanted. It's not quite as mysterious or incredible as what it seems. But what if there's something really incredible happening here that if we pause for a moment, that all of a sudden it will become enchanted, mysterious, incredible in a new way to us again. You see, I grew up in northern Maine. And growing up in northern Maine, it quickly lost its shine. It quickly lost its enchantment. You see, over time, you start to get tired of all of the winters, the snow, the fact that there are no peoples, there are no restaurants, there is nothing to do. And so I could just imagine, and I knew that there was a time coming where I would leave northern Maine and I would head out into the world where there was actually something to do. And it was really something where Maine became just disenchanted. But I found myself saying these words the other day to Holly. I said, I miss Maine. And I almost like, <laughs> like tried to put them back. You ever have one of those moments? You're like, hey, I'm put that thing back in. And so uh, the reality was I was thinking about Maine. I was thinking about the beauty of northern Maine, all of the evergreens, the snow that is always on top of those evergreens, the fact that you can go out into the wilderness and not see somebody else, not hear a car go by. You can see the stars without light pollution. And all of a sudden, northern Maine became re-enchanted. And so I hope that you have this kind of experience with the baby in the manger 2,000 years ago, that once again, this might be a beautiful moment for us, an enchanted moment for us where the supernatural and the natural collide in this Christmas moment 2,000 years ago. You see, as we talk about this text, what you'll notice is that there's this contrast of powers. 
you know, you have Caesar Augustus. You have the imperial empire of Rome and the leader of Rome, the one who by his decree and edict is able to make things happen. He's able to displace people groups, so much so that this young nobody woman who's pregnant is displaced from where she is meant to be. And on the way, uh, according to the edict, she ends up giving birth to this nobody kid in the middle of nowhere. And so you have this picture in your mind of this incredible imperial power, and then this nobody, this woman that nobody knows about, nobody cares about, nobody's interested in what's happening in Bethlehem of Judea. They're not, you know, throwing out a bunch of banners in this moment. And, and in this, you see the contrast of these two moments. Who knows this woman? Who knows this child? No one really cares. And who knows, who's told the news about this child? Well, you would think that it would be echoed through the halls of those who are of high estate. You'd think that it would be the imperial palace guard that would be telling you the king has been born. But instead, who does the nose show up to but a bunch of social outcasts, right? Who does God declare his great plan of his coming Messiah to but a bunch of stinky shepherds, right? That's, that's who he shows up to. And you're like, what's happening here? What is God doing? Because that's not what I would have planned if I were God. I, I would have, if I were God, I would have said, listen, there's a way that I'm going to declare that like this is, I'm, I'm going to show up to the best of the best. I'm going to show up to the, uh, to the upper class. That's where I'm going to show up. And yet revealed in the Christmas story is the heart of God. Revealed in the Christmas story is the way that God works among us. And here in the contrast between the powers of the world and the power of God, we begin to catch a glimpse of who God really is and how he really is for us. We come to these two verses in Luke chapter 2, this glad tidings given by the angels that say, Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth, and lying in a manger. I hope that today, what we get from this message, what we get from this passage is very simply this, that God has revealed in Jesus that he is for you. That God has revealed in Jesus that he is for you. We see that twice in this passage. And so I hope that as we unpack the idea of God being for you, that we had better understand what in the world does this mean? And how is this good news for you and for me this Christmas season? First, we see that he's born for you. Is that not what it says? That today in the city of, of David, a savior was born for you. And who are they speaking to? But to these shepherds, these nobodies. They're the people that are kind of on the outskirts of civilization, separated from everybody else, doing the hard work, sleeping under the stars, that nobody is really wondering, what are the shepherds doing? Nobody's following the shepherds on social media. They got a, a tiny, you know, their friends and family maybe are following them. And yet to this group of people, the Savior is born. To the group of people in the nation of Israel, that they weren't even looking for God. Like, they weren't even, like, interested in God showing up, really. There was a little group who were, but for the most part, they weren't looking for God. And yet to those who weren't looking for God, God went looking for them. And so this Christmas, if you feel like maybe you're not really looking for God, this Christmas, if you feel like you're the, the overlooked, if you feel like you're the outcast, if you feel like you're the sinful that doesn't really have a place at the table with the God of the universe, just know that you're in good company because that's the news that was preached to those kind of people, that he was born for you. And what kind of person was born for you? Well, we see a descriptor in three ways. First, there was a Savior born for you. That's what the text says. And this idea of Savior goes back all the way to the Old Testament, to this incredible event where the nation of Israel is in captivity to the nation of Egypt. And what we see is that the Savior God makes a way for Israel to find freedom from captivity. And we see that God is a God who saves 
And so as Jesus shows up on the scene, he is pronounced the savior, which is good news for you and for me, because for those of us who feel like we're trapped to an old way of life, to those of us who feel like there's this addiction that we can't get out of, to those of us who feel like we're living in darkness or that there's a shadow side of us that we can't seem to get rid of, it's to that group of people that God showed up to. And so he says, a savior is born to you. He says, a Messiah, meaning the anointed one. And the anointed one shows up as the perfect prophet, priest, and king, the prophet who reveals the way to God to us, the priest who is able to stand before God and man and intercede on our behalf, and the king who would rule and reign over all things. One theologian, uh, Thomas Oden, says it this way, as Messiah, Jesus is the Lord's anointed agent of salvation author of salvation, redeemer, mediator, light of the world, the desire of nations, the expected one of Israel. He was called Jesus Christ, the righteous, the righteous one, sanctifier, the holy one who presides over our justification in the court and our sanctification in the temple. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, the mediator of a new covenant, the way, the truth, and the life. Let us see him who he is. And not just for, you know, humanity in general, but specifically for you. That for you, he would say that as the Messiah, that he's your redeemer, your mediator, your light in the darkness, your desire of your heart, your righteous one, your sanctifier, your justifier. And there in Jesus, we see a Messiah. And there also not only Savior, Messiah, but also Lord. That we see he's Lord, that is in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's the same word used for God. That he's saying, this is God who has come to dwell among us to save a people to himself from their sins, to redeem us from death, to redeem us from our old way so that we might be a new humanity. Now, it might seem like at first blush that that's good news. But as I think about the idea of a savior, a Messiah, a Lord, that's not good news in a lot of ways. It's not good news because I've rebelled against that Lord. It's not good news because I've sinned and rightfully deserve punishment. It's not good news because I see the ways that I've said no to that kingdom and yes to mine. And what that means is a king who shows up to a bunch of rebellious servants crushes them under the weight of his justice. And so I start to wonder to myself, is Christmas good news? If he's the Savior, if he's the Messiah, if he's the Lord, if he comes in power, and if any of those who are opposed to him are crushed under the weight of his glory, is there good news this Christmas? And I love that it says not only that he was born for you, but there's a sign for you. Now, when I think of sign and royalty, I would imagine, well, the sign for you is that he shows up in the halls of Caesar, The sign for you is that he's clothed in purple garments. It means that he shows up and he gets in a gilded bassinet, you know, made of gold. The sign for you is that he does some miracle. Maybe the people who see him are able to see all of a sudden or, you know, the the, the dead, they're raised to life. That's what I imagine the sign is. Isn't that that what you would imagine the sign would be? He's going to do some amazing work among us. And yet, what's the sign? You're like, this is it, God? A baby lying in a manger wrapped in a cloth. And I think that's it. That's what we're coming up with is that as the sign. Like no voice from heaven. A baby lying in a manger. That's it. But that's what causes good news for us. Because it's here that in contrast to the might and power of Caesar Augustus who comes to crush all of his enemies to bring about the peace of Rome through death, what do we see in contrast with Jesus and with God, but a very different way of demonstrating his power and his being for us. What a difference when we have a baby in a manger and we see that God doesn't come to crush, but he comes in vulnerability. It's there where God meets us as somebody who's vulnerable like us. 
It's there where God meets us in the midst of our weakness. It's there where God meets us in the midst of our need. It's there where God shows up like you and me, vulnerable, and he becomes like you and me so that we might become like him. And so the sign is not that he comes with pomp and circumstance crushing his enemies. The sign is he shows up as a child like you and me, vulnerable. The same hands that carved out the ocean, the same voice that spoke the galaxy and universe into existence, omnipotent with God. And how does he show up? A sign of a baby. And not only that, but we see a baby who's vulnerable, wrapped in a cloth, humility. He shows up not wrapped in luxurious garments, not wrapped in the best of what society had to offer, but kind of just what was at hand. And here we see a humble savior. It's this humble savior who lives a humble life who lives a life that really on the world stage, nobody's watching Jesus. Everybody's watching the Roman Empire. Everybody's watching the great empires of the world. Nobody's really focusing on Jesus. He lives a ministry of humility. And what happens at his death, but he dies on a Roman cross. And what is he wrapped in but humble garments as he's placed in a tomb? And we see a humble savior who meets us in the midst of our need and it's in that humility that he dies the death that we deserve and yet what we find is that in that humility he overcomes the power of the enemy we're reminded that there is a dragon in the world stage of the manger scene there is one who desires to overcome the one who is born that desires to devour him that desires to rule over god himself and we see the death in these moments utilizing power to try to overcome God but what does God do he shows up in weakness and humility and vulnerability and there the enemy is overcome and so we see a savior show up as a baby wrapped in a cloth and placed in a manger we see his vulnerability his humility his poverty if you know what it is to need so does he if you know what it's like to wonder he does too. If you wonder maybe if there are moments and you're wondering, where is God in the midst of my suffering? That you would say, he's right here. He's right next to you in the midst of your need. He knows what it's like to walk like you and me. And so he perfectly knows how to intercede for us in our weaknesses. And so what does God show up like? Like Caesar Augustus in pomp and circumstance, like what we would imagine with all the signs that we imagine? No, the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord shows up in humility, welcoming us to greet the King of kings and the Lord of lords that we might partake in his life that we might partake in a different way of being. Does Jesus overlook the poor? No, he's entered into the world as the poor. Does he overlook the vulnerable? No, he's entered in the world as the vulnerable. Does he overlook the humble? No, he's entered the world as humble. And there we see the difference. The enchantment all of a sudden begins to be a little bit more clear as we realize that God is not like you and me. We don't write this story imagining that we understand God. Instead, we allow him to write his story and reveal himself to us that in power and glory and majesty, how does he reveal himself? But the king who serves, the king who dies, and the king who allows us to have right relationship with the God of the universe. And there we begin to see the mystery and the beauty of God revealed to us in Christmas. A baby in a manger. I think sometimes... I think the way that we picture Jesus is we picture him like we do in our activity, a porcelain doll. You know, if you drop him, he'll break. You know, we imagine him like all of these kind of nativity stories as we see these pageants and plays at churches as this cute, chubby little baby staying in a manger. But what we forget to realize is that wrapped up in that package is the omnipotent God of the universe who enters into our suffering to redeem us and save us from our sin. And that's the beauty of Christmas. To receive this King of Kings is to see with different eyes. 
It's to see that God doesn't approach us the way that we thought he would, that he doesn't show up in the way that we thought that he did, but to recognize and to receive him as he is, to say that in this moment, God is beckoning us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ, that anyone who had come to him might experience the fullness of life. And anyone who has gotten distracted by the world and the ways of power that we think maybe the way of the dragon is the way to go, maybe the way of Caesar Augustus is the way to go, that there we're reminded to live once again the life as Jesus did, to come once again unto the humble Savior and to receive from him the gifts of one who is always willing to, with open arms, receive you if we would but respond in repentance and faith. There we begin to see that the good tidings of great joy is that he was born to set us free, that he was born to give us second birth, and there we experience the beauty and joy of Christmas. I hope that as we experience Christmas that there's a little bit of a mystery, that there's a little bit of like, could this be true? Could it be true that the God of the universe would be found in human flesh to redeem us from our sin? Could it be not only that he wants us to one day go to heaven as if like that's the only point of why Jesus came? Could it be true that it is truly Emmanuel, God with us? And what if the great unfolding of human history and of your story and my story is not that someday we get to dwell with him, but today, but this moment and every moment. And the good news is that he came to dwell with us, not someday, but now, to be united with us. And the good news of the gospel is that God loves you, and he sent his son for you. And there we see, born for you, sign for you, that you might come and receive of the humble king, and there be able to receive what the fullness of life truly is in faith. I love that we uh, experience this in baptism, which is an outward side of an inward work of what God has done. And I love that God uses water because water, it has a way of flowing to the lowest point. You ever notice that? You know, like there's never water sitting up on the top of a mountain. You know, it's like it flows down the mountain to find its lowest point. And isn't that what happened with God? That when we take a peek into what God is really like, that in humility, he comes and descends to be with us at the lowest point to be able to welcome us there in our low space. I love that water, it's common, right? Like we use water all the time. And yet in the common, isn't it also something incredible that God does something in the water and he allows us to experience a means of grace to find him in a new way. And I love that water as we come to it is a reminder that over and over again that we did not search for God first, but yet he found us first, that we weren't those who are worthy. And so if you feel like today somehow you are worthy, well, let me tell you, you're not. God is gracious, and uh, there's probably not that many of you, but if there are those of you who feel unworthy, well, let me tell you, you're not worthy. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came and Jesus lived and Jesus died and Jesus rose again for those who who are unworthy. And so we sing, oh, come all you unfaithful, because we are unfaithful. And we're reminded every time that we show up to church that we are bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and there we're made right with God. And so baptism is this reminder as we go under the water that we have died to our old way of life. And what a great weapon for us to use against the enemy, that when he levels an accusation against us and says, what a sinner you are, or when he says, you are so messed up, that it's in that moment that we say, wait, 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 the old me has died. There is no such thing as Matt Labby apart from Christ anymore, and the new has come, and I've been baptized into Jesus Christ, and no more can you level an accusation against me than can you level an accusation against Jesus himself because we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and there the beauty of baptism, and there the beauty of baptism every single day as we recognize the joyous news of the gospel that the king of kings was born a savior, the Messiah, the Lord, and that he came clothed in vulnerability and humility and poverty to meet you and I in the midst of our need. And there we experience the beauty of the gospel. 
And so as a part of our celebrating today, that work of God among us and that work of God to sanctify, save us in these moments today, we have Lily to be baptized. And so Lily, we'd love for you to come up and to share some of your story that you prepared for us. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Lily, and I'm here to get baptized. But first I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story. First I wanted to say, there was never a period in my life I cut off from God because something bad happened, or that I was introduced to him only recently. I grew up knowing his name and praying before meals, but I didn't know what it truly meant to have faith and actually love God or what it meant to live with him. Not to say I'm perfect now or that I have the world's best relationship with him. I mean, there are so many things I have to work on, <laughs> but don't we all? I personally struggle with putting him before everything and everyone, reading my Bible and falling asleep or getting distracted with my thoughts when I try to pray. But I plan to bury that with my old self and start a new life with God. But let's go back a bit. How did I get to this point? How did I connect with him? Truthfully, I didn't do it. It was all God, all of it. And I can feel that that's the reason my family and I are here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and go to church with the people I do. Because since I've been here, I feel the Holy Spirit has grown in me. And now wherever I'll go, I ha I'll have the Holy Spirit in my head and heart. And that's why I plan on worshiping him forever. And while, and why I'll ask him to help me not to stray from him and why I'm getting baptized. Thank you. So Lily, I have a a few statements and then a few questions for you. So, Lily, in keeping with the example of Jesus, you have presented yourself this day that you might receive the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is not itself the door to salvation, but is an outward sign of the new birth which God has wrought in your heart. It proclaims to all the world that you have taken Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and that it is your purpose always to obey him. In order that we may hear your testimony of what God has done and that we may know that you understand the significance of the steps, I have a few questions for you. You can wait until the end, and then I'll ask you if you agree. Do you believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ the Son suffered in your place on the cross and that he died but rose again, that he now sits at the Father's right hand until he returns to judge all people on the last day? Do you believe in the Holy Scriptures, that by the grace of God, those who repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are justified by faith? If you believe that, say, I believe. Well, Lily, it is my privilege to baptize you. And so we're all going to be able to experience a moment uh, today because the reality is um, there are certain liturgical churches that when you step into them, that there's actually what's known as a baptismal font uh, that you walk by on your way in. And the reason why is because there's a reminder that as you walk in, uh, typically you would dip your fingers and then make the sign of the cross on yourself. And the reason why is because the reason we walk into the presence of God, the reason why we are justified, it's a reminder every single time that we have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And so I think there are these moments that we receive and that we remember the beauty of what God has done. And so maybe this is new to you or maybe unfamiliar to you, but I would love for those of us who have been found in Jesus Christ, for those of us who have received of the lamb who is slain, for those of us who have put our faith and hope in him, 
that once again this Christmas, that we don't simply go through Christmas in the usual motion, but that we pause for a moment in recognizing the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord that was born for you. And that as we walk before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we never walk with our own righteousness. We're never clothed with our own clothes, but instead we're wrapped in the clothes of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to do something a little different. Maybe some of y'all are going to feel uncomfortable. That's okay. But what we're going to do is I would love for you to come up to the baptismal, for you to dip your fingers in the waters. For those of you who are comfortable, I would love for you to make the sign of the cross, to remember that Jesus Christ was born for you, a reminder of the justification found in Christ and Christ alone, as a reminder that you are found right before him because of the beautiful work of Jesus. And that this Christmas, yes, though we are weak, though we are unstable, though we are unworthy, though we're overwhelmed, though we're the outcast, though we've sinned this week, though it seems like we don't know what we're doing or why we're doing what we're doing, that we are found by Jesus Christ here, that we are found in him, that we've been made right by faith and grace of Jesus Christ. And it's there that we're reminded of the beauty of the enchantment of Christmas, that for all of us, Christ was born, that for you, he was given. And as we come forward to remind ourselves of the beautiful work of Jesus Christ, that we are found righteous before God because of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so uh, I'd love for you to go ahead and form a line down the middle. We're going to sing a song while we're doing this. So come, let us adore him. For all of those of us who are found in Jesus Christ by faith, I invite you to come forward to dip your hands in the baptismal water yet again to remind ourselves of the beautiful work of Jesus Christ. Please come forward.